today. Um, I thought I would do just a little bit of information sharing around eating and feeding challenges. Um, and I thought what I would do is focus it around kids who have sensory difficulties because it's such a wide area that we can cover. I thought I'm going to try and make it just a little bit um, more focused. Uh, yeah, so let's go into this. If at any point you want to ask questions, just type it into the chat box and I've, I've made sure that there's enough time for questions afterwards. Um, okay, so um, my name is Anitha. I'm an occupational therapist. Uh, I am, own Sensational Kids Therapy and we work with lots of schools in Kingston. I feel like I don't, yeah, I'll say that each time. Okay, so as OTs, what we do is we realize, we talk about activities of daily living or what's called your ADLs. And we've, we've recognized just how important being able to eat and being able to feed ourselves is as an activity of daily living, okay? It is, um, for kids, it's a really, really important milestone as they develop. And if a child can't eat or can't feed themselves or struggles with that, it can have some fairly significant medical, social, and emotional implications for the child and their family, and also just anyone who works with that child and family, okay? Um, quite often what we'll see is that meal times become incredibly stressful um, and, and can result in some really significant negative effects for the, the child, the family, and anyone else in their life. Um, so these are the kids who you'll see, they struggle to eat at restaurants, they struggle to eat at their birthday parties, or anywhere that's unfamiliar or different. They can't eat at school in the, in the main dining room because it's too noisy. Um, anything like that is going to become really stressful for them and for their families. Okay. Um, right. So what I thought we would do is we'd look at eating, feeding, meal times, and our eight senses. So um, I think I covered this a little bit last week um, with regards to the eight senses. So um, we're going to look at our plate of food. We're going to look at our utensils. We're going to look at who's sitting with us, where they are, how close they are to us. Um, it was quite funny yesterday. We had, I was sitting in the clinic and someone said, oh, interesting. This um, person has said, um, oh, the child doesn't like when other people touch their food. And we all laughed and said, actually, I don't think anyone likes it when someone else touches the food on their plate. Um, so that's the sight side. And then there's the smell. So smell is really important. It can be really emotional. Um, you know, there are smells that really trigger memories as well. So you can smell something and you'll go, oh my gosh, that's what my, my mum used to smell of it. Or I remember that hospital smell and then we have that fear of the dentist or things like that. Okay, so smells are really important as well taste. Um, we're going to decide if our food is salty, sweet, sour, bitter, um, and then the implications of that. The auditory is listening to perhaps a meal being cooked, um, what's happening in the environment, others talking. Um, you know, if you have a family where there are perhaps more than one child with um, um, additional needs, you might find that one of them is very vocal, which then might affect the other child, okay? Um, and then touch. So we can feel if our food is hot or cold, crunchy or soft. Um, and, and that's also really important. We can feel the cutlery in our hands and being able to do that well enough, okay? Um, we then have our three other senses, which is our vestibular sense. Um, and that is, if you remember, it's how we know which way is up or down, if we're moving fast or slowly, if I'm turning like this, my head is staying kind of still. So is my vestibular sense then being activated? So all of those things. Um, your vestibular system has, I think, one of the biggest impacts on your daily function because it affects your posture, your balance, um, movement, coordination, your attention, and your arousal. 
And those are all the things that are going to help a child stay in their seat at the table um, and, and remain engaged throughout the meals. Um, we, I'm just going to pause there for a second. Tom, can you hear the dogs fighting under my chair or not? I can't hear anything. Okay, perfect. Um, sorry, then I'll just continue. That's fine. Okay. Um, sorry about that, guys. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's our vestibular sense, just being able to sit upright. And we take that for granted, you know, if you think some kids have such poor control that they can't actually physically sit up without a huge amount of effort. And then we ask them to feed themselves. Um, so it becomes quite hard. Um, we then think about our proprioceptive sense, and that is when our muscles are all working together. We know where our muscles are, where our bodies are in comparison to our own body, to other people, other objects, okay? Um, and it is what helps us to generate really coordinated movements so that we can successfully execute tasks. Um, and movements or activities that you can do which support that proprioceptive sense of things like climbing, crushing, uh, bouncing, crawling, all those things that we mentioned about the heavy work, um, the heavy work activities. Okay, um, and we can see how our proprioceptive system is going to work in the sense of bringing the food to our mouth. So um, looking at the person I'm talking to, reaching for my cup, knowing how heavy it is, bringing it up to my lips, having a drink, swallowing that, that whole sensation, knowing how much is in my mouth. Okay, so that's that. That's quite crucial in terms of that um, proprioception. And then we talk about our um, another sense, which is our interoception. And this is lesser known, but still just really, really important because it's about helping you understand and feel what's going on inside your body. So um, we often get kids who struggle with their interoception and they may struggle knowing when they're feeling hungry, when they're feeling full, um, temperature, cold or hot, um, thirsty, and all of these things will make self-regulation quite difficult for them. You know, it's like when they need the bathroom and they don't. Um, yeah, so that's your interoception. Um, and, and when we think of our, sen our, our senses, it's about how we integrate all of our senses in our bodies at all times, okay? Um, and sometimes that's where the difficulty comes is that kids are struggling to integrate this. So we also think of our sensory in terms of three main areas. We talk about modulation or modulating the senses and that's when someone might be oversensitive um, they might be defensive or they can't filter out sensations okay um, and what you find is if a child has difficulty modulating they may have real food sensitivities or be really picky eaters um, they'll struggle with different textures in their mouths um, and your modulation is really going to affect your arousal, your attention, and your behavioral responses, okay? Um, and what happens is if you have a really high level of arousal, that can often cause quite significant mealtime problems. Um, another side of your sensory is when we struggle to discriminate sensory inputs. So that is knowing the specific qualities of those sensations here. Um, so if a child has decreased awareness, it's gonna affect how they're gonna learn their skills, build their skills, knowing where the food is in their mouth or how to move the food from side to side, how to use their tongue, how to feel if there's like a tiny little bit of food still stuck somewhere um, and drinking from a cup, like an open cup without spilling, all of that is so really, really important. Um, and then the last area that we come to is what we call praxis. So this is how we can plan and sequence all the steps of the motor task, okay? And that is, again, going to be really dependent on your effective sensory discrimination. Um, and what you'll see is that when a child has difficulties with praxis, they may struggle to coordinate how they're going to 
scoop the food? How are they going to stab the food? How are they going to bring it up to their mouths? Um, you know, close their lips, move the spoon away, move the food about. And just holding utensils can be really, really quite tricky if there are some practice difficulties going on. Okay. Um, I thought I would just talk a little bit as in a couple of seconds about feeding versus eating. Okay. Um, so feeding is everything that you're doing to setting up, arranging, bringing the solid or liquid food from the plate or the cup to the mouth. Okay, that's going to be how well you can use your knife and fork, how you're going to move the food around on your plate, being able to cut the sausage up, um, you know, scooping it, pressing hard enough. If you're gonna pour yourself a cup of juice or a cup of water, um, pouring gravy onto your, um, your pudding, those are skills and they require quite good practice and motor coordination. Um, when we talk about eating, that's about what happens in our mouth. So keeping the food in your mouth, being able to have adequate lip closure, manipulating the food while your mouth is closed, using your tongue to move the food from side to side, to swallow the fluid, to know that you are having water versus, say, a thick drinking yogurt, um, and then swallowing that is, is moving the food from the mouth down to the stomach. Okay, so you can see how complex it is and how you can have so many areas where things can um, be impacted. So uh, any um, sensitivities that you have, if you have poor motor skills, that's all going to impact your eating, okay? And we'll say that children can have difficulties with one or both of these areas. Right. Okay. Um, so when we, if we just spend a moment and we think about eating, feeding, meal time, and our sensory processing, eating is one of those tasks, um, the very few tasks where a child does need to use all of their senses. Um, and that makes it so much more complex. Okay. Um, and so not only do we use all these senses, but again, rem remember, you've got all your um, connections that you've made with eating so from that emotional memory side of things as well. Um, if we look at, um, <clears throat> sorry, if we look at our, our modulation, you can find that your child can be really oversensitive and defensive, especially because of the tactile area. The face, as I've said before, is one of those really, really sensitive areas. Um, and, and if you have a child who's really sensitive to taste or textures, they are going to have a really limited food intake. And these are the kids who get preferred because they have really restricted intake. So they might only eat eight foods. Um, they're very, very limited. And that child might have some real sensitivities about having food in their mouths, around their mouths, um, and just on their faces. Uh, you can also have this when the child is really over-responsive to the smell of food, um, the sound that the different foods make, or just the sight of it, you know, just looking at the food. And if you have like a mixed type food, they just, the, the sight of that might just be too much for them to cope with. Okay, um, sounds of people eating is quite um, a big area as well. And I've got so many families where um, the child or the young person cannot eat with their family because they have that verse, that big response when they hear their siblings or their families chew or swallow as well. Um, and, and what happens is when you have these modulation difficulties, you often then have your increased arousal because that child is going into that fight, flight, freeze. Um, and so then they can't focus on 
their food and the meal time, and then it will then change their behavior. <clears throat> okay. Um, when we talk about our discrimination, if you have poor discrimination, you're going to have poor awareness of the food in your mouth, around your mouth. So these are the kids who might have food all over their faces and they have absolutely no idea. Um, and and it's, it's, it's gonna make it really difficult for a child to be aware of where the food is in their mouth. So if there's food stuck, how they can use their tongue to then move that food about. Um, and it might also really limit their food preferences, okay? Um, it can also impact on that oral motor ability to use the tongue while the lips are closed um, and using the lips, the cheeks, all of that um, side, side of things as well. Um, and then we talk about our postural control and our practice, so our motor skills. And again, um, as I mentioned earlier, if you can't sit up right at the table, without a huge amount of effort, it's going to be even harder for you then to lift your, um, move your head down, catch your food and do that while staying stable, okay, managing that food, scooping the food, if you think of having soup. Um, so being able to be upright, being able to have those motor skills is absolutely crucial as well um, in terms of of the whole um, eating and feeding process, okay. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time just looking at kind of different profiles you can have of kids who come um, or where your child's difficulty might be. So um, those are the areas and if we go through them um, yeah. So you can have your, there, there, I'm just going to move on to the next one. Okay, so when we're talking about a generalized, so like a big, complete, whole sensory and motor dysfunction, um, this is those areas where it's not just one difficulty, so they have a huge range of difficulties, okay? Um, and that is what's going to impact their eating and their mealtime performance. So what you can have here is a combination of your modulation difficulties, so oversensitive, undersensitive, their discrimination, knowing where the food is, being able to set up right, being able to use their cutlery. Then, okay, um, some kids get extremely uncomfortable around certain foods. So when I do food groups, you'll see the one child who can't actually even look at the plate when say it's a green day or um, everything is green and there's some guacamole or some mushed up avocado, but they physically can't cope with the sight of that. Um, and that makes it hard for them to then stay at the chair or the child that's got such weak core strength, core stability that is really, really hard for them to sit up in the chair. So they're gonna be slumping they're going to be fidgeting and moving the whole time because they're not stable and they're constantly seeking that stability. Um, and, and then you're going to have those who are difficult with chewing and using their utensils. Okay. Um, you're going to find that these kids are also going to have difficulties away from mealtime. Um, and so that is being able to pay attention or to focus well enough, to process all that information in their immediate community of their home, the community at school, or just the larger um, community. Okay. Um, so that was your generalized sensory and motor dysfunction. Then we have kind of more of a general sensory discrimination dysfunction. Um, and this is where they only have problems with how they are they are using their discrimination and it may affect their postural control motor skills and also their oral motor skills. <clears throat> um, this is where that child is just really struggling staying in the chair, struggling to be stable in their chair to maintain that position. Okay, and quite often um, what, what you'll see is that at, at homes, um, generally a dining room table is made for adults 
the case. So you'll find you have kids who are sitting on at the dining room table. They might not have the right size chair. So the child's going to be sitting really low down and the calculator is going to be up here, which is going to make it even harder for them. Okay, so it's thinking about those things, making sure that your child can have their feet on the ground um, or on a support because being grounded is so important and just being able to find that stability. Um, I find all the next catalogs, I don't think they do them anymore, um, are fantastic for just taping them. I would say the old telephone books, but that's really gonna show my age. Um, and, and just having those, under your child's feet. It's gonna be really important for them to be more stable. Okay, um, again, it's being able to use and manipulate those utensils. And, and, and we can make a lot of adjustment in terms of you can get spoons that you can bend. So all that child or young person has to do is scoop the food and they don't even have to think about then bending it because the, um, the bowl of the spoon is already bent go into their mouth um so all of those things being able to manage that um quite often you find that kids have a really limited way of chewing so they might just be able to do up and down and you'll find when you watch a child eat that actually they're not using um their big teeth at the back to grind the food up so that's all they can do and then they swallow okay and that's going to be quite restrictive as well um and what you'll see is when you have this generalized kind of discrimination dysfunction is that these kids are going to be struggling with all their adl so the dressing undressing bathing washing all this self-care um and their social activities are all going to be that little bit harder for them okay um so we can have a generalized sensory defensiveness. Um, and these are the kids who will over respond to many types of infants. So they over respond to lots of visual stimuli or if the room's too bright, they struggle then. They over respond when there's a lot of noise in the environment or when the acoustics aren't quite right. They might um, over respond to the sight of the food. Um, the texture of the food, the texture of what it feels like in their mouth, okay. Um, and these kids become really, really uncomfortable with just everyday experiences um, and being able to focus. These are the kids who really don't want to be touched. Um, and, and you then get these negative responses which come out because they have this fear um, and, and they've got these connections with the, the smell, the taste, the texture of the food. Um, and that can be really quite hard for them. And, and what we find is that these kids become really quite rigid around foods. They struggle with focusing on anything other than the food being exactly what they asked for, exactly in the right positions, not touching, being separated. Um, and you'll find that you can have some really big emotional behavioral outbursts or responses at the table um, because of this. Okay. Um, we talk about our oral sensory defensiveness. So these are the kids who are really struggling with everything around their mouth. So we're talking about their lips, outside of their lips, inside of their lips, we're talking about the cheek, um, the tongue but it's not necessarily going to be the rest of the body, okay? Um, they might have an extreme discomfort around the taste of the food, the texture of the food, that smell, and they're gonna start avoiding these. Um, they're gonna be very rigid with how they choose foods, how they select foods. Um, and I can remember when my, my kids were little and I would find a food that they liked, I would literally then go and, um, and buy, you know, if it was an offer or um, I would buy like just a huge amount of this one brand of food. Um, and then a week later, they no longer want that food. So then I'm stuck with all of this. Um, so it's that type of thing. And they want it all to be exactly the same. And these are the kids you might think, oh, I'm going to change the packaging. So I'm going to, I'm going to make them think that my homemade um, 
chicken goujons have come from the um the Sainsbury's bag and they will know yeah they just um they know because they're that sensitive and, and they have really strong reactions so you know they might gag they might throw up they might just not be able to stay there because it's just it's so hard for them okay um Right. Um, um, we're then going to look at the other two. So that's your oral sensory discrimination based oral motor difficulty. Big um, little titles there. So some kids will have their um, sensory discrimination difficulties, which is going to impact on their oral motor structures, but not the rest of the body. Okay. So these are the kids who have re quite delayed oral motor skills. They can't um, have that lip closure when they're drinking. They become really messy eaters, so the food will go absolutely everywhere. They can't chew. Um, they can't manipulate or move the food around um, their mouths. And these are the kids who will choose the easy food. They're not going to want to have the meat that has to be chewed several times. These are the kids who you, if you look at their repertoire of food, they might really have um, had a preference for the crisps or the crackers, which are what we call bite and dissolve. So there's not a lot of effort going in there. So your skips, your quavers, um, you bite it, it disperses, it dissolves. Okay, so really easy to cope with or really smooth food. So the kids who can't move on from that really fine, um pureed food because that's just uh, in the mouth and swallow um and then when you do that and then you then add different textures they really struggle with that okay um you can also have the um some sensitivities around there the smells and the taste um and and you'll find that these kids are often the grazers because it's so physically hard for them to chew, it's so physically hard for them to move the food from one side to the other, to make sure that it's really ground down finely before they swallow. Um, they will have a lot of fatigue. And so they are just going to be eating throughout the day because it's easier for them to manage it that way. Okay. Um, and then when you have your the combination, so this is when the kids have difficulties with oral defensiveness and their sensory discrimination around their um, oral structures, okay? Um, so these are the kids who have babies that don't want anything in their mouths. So they miss that crucial mouthing stage. And actually, if you think about that, that's how kids and babies, when they're younger, everything goes into the mouth. That's how they explore. That's how they figure out the qualities of, of what's going into their mouths. Um, you know, and, and later on, these are the kids who are going to really struggle knowing if something is crunchy, if it's tough, if it's chewy, um, the mixed textures and how they can cope with that. Um, and, and you'll find that these kids will again also have real extreme discomfort around the sensory properties of the food. Okay, so if they have um, casserole, which has got bits in it, or one day they have a really smooth soup and then the next day they go somewhere else and they are chunks of carrots in the soup. So they really struggle with that, making those changes. Okay. Um, in terms of kind of tricks and tips, they're all gonna be the ones that I'm going to mention here are very generalized because every child, every family, every situation is so different. Um, and, and that's why I can't say, you know, this will work for every single child. But in terms of just some general tips and tricks, it know that you can have a child or you can have three kids in your family and they all have different thresholds, different um, levels of arousal. Um, that makes it for us as parents okay 
So what we want to do is to make sure that not necessarily at meal times, but at other times our kids have really exciting, stimulating environments where they can look at different things, hear lots of different sounds. So they have that enrichment coming in. Um, you want to make sure that you can get a lot of different tactile um, inputs in. So walking on grass, walking on paving stones with your bare feet. There, if that's going to be really hard, using socks, um, you know, playing in sand. We could we cannot spare dry sand or wet sand, but it's just giving all of those opportunities. Yeah. Um, if your child is particularly oversensitive, you're going to try and just bring the volume of that sound, of that sensation down. You're going to dampen that sensation. Yeah. So if you have a child who is looking around at everything. So in a restaurant, you're then going to know that actually they're not going to eat much in that restaurant. And if we want to go as a family, I need to make sure that my son is eaten a fair amount beforehand because I know at meal times he's going to struggle to eat enough. Okay. Um, and, and you might say, you know, let's have some spaces where it's quiet. Let's have some calming sensory places it might just be a little corner of of a room where you put up a sheet around it as like a makeshift tent within um so that you're just blocking out the extra visuals putting you know you can get a cardboard box and make a little stand to go around their tables um if you've got a child who oh, sorry really struggles with noise they could be wearing noise cancelling headphones if they are in a busy environment they could be having ear defenders they could have some um therapeutic listening music at the time that they're eating as well okay um we're also going to want to try and, and try and do activities where we're going to decrease their sensitivity if and when that child is ready for it okay so if you have a child who really does not like getting their hands messy, then you're going to give them opportunities for using your soapy foam, your sand, your um, aqua beads, or you're going to go to your dries. So your dry rice, your pasta, your beans, and then gradually introduce the wet um, textures that they, um, and tactile inputs into that, just slowly build up their tolerance over time. Okay. Um, if you have a child with really poor awareness of what's going on, you want to then increase or turn up the volume of that sensation. Um, it's really important that we're constantly working on their posture, their postural muscles, their postural core, their tone, their um, postural stability. And so giving them chances to jump, to run, to climb up the slide, to climb up the stairs, go down the slide, crawling, scooting, all of those are going to be really important to develop that postural control so that it's not so hard for the child to sit at the table. Okay. Um, and if you just stop for a moment and think about your posture right now, are you slumped? Is your back curved? Are you leaning on something? Um, or are you sitting quite nice and upright? Where are your feet? If you are um, shorter like I am, my feet are often dangling, so I have to put them on, on something. So think about that. Think about everything in terms of yourself, um, and then you can relate it to, to your child. Okay. Um, I, I can't stress predictability enough. You know, having those, if you have a child that's going to be really anxious about eating, have a lot of sensitivities, try and keep those routines the same. So the child will always sit on a certain chair, a certain place at the table, which might be with their backs to the wall so they can see anything coming in if they are concerned about being touched. Um, and just so having those predictable routine is really important. Um, don't force a child to eat anything. You know, there's, and, and we might not think we're forcing them, but by saying, if you have two bites of this, 
I will buy you the new, I don't know what the toys are now, the new Lego set. Um, and that is really, because that child really wants that thing, it's you are making them feel incredibly uncomfortable. And what we do then is this child psychs himself up, they have the two bites, and we then say, oh my gosh, that was so great. Okay, just one more bite, and then that bite is gone. Okay, so it's really about helping that child feel completely safe at mealtimes and making sure that it's a positive environment, it's a positive interaction, and it's a pleasant experience. Because, you know, eating, having a meal should be a really pleasant, enjoyable experience. Um, and we need that child to feel safe because when they feel safe, when we feel safe, we then think, okay, I'm going to go out of my comfort zone a little bit. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to try something new. Um, so, yeah, that's quite important. Um, let the kids play with their food. Let them get messy. That's how they learn. You know, they learn if they pick up the pea or the pasta. That's how it feels. And by feeling it with their hands first, they can then think, okay, it might be okay in my mouth. If I could do this and then it didn't work. Um, some families really struggle with food being played with at mealtimes or at the dinner table. And you can then set up a separate food playtime. Yeah. So just it's going to be a messy play. We're going to get out of mat and we're going to have everything on there and we're just going to explore. Okay. Um, looking at the the language that we use is quite important as well. So when we're looking at new foods, rather than saying, oh, it's yummy, or this is really nice, or it's tasty, say, oh, my word, this is really cold and crunchy, or, oh, that feels a little bit crackly, um, or that's quite hard to bite through. And then as soon as I bite, it just went everywhere. So being really enthusiastic and just using like really descriptive language, or this is really sweet, or, oh, it's sweet at the start and then it's sour um, and so that's going to get them knowing what they can possibly expect before they have to put it into their mouth okay um, getting them involved in food prep meal prep the shopping side of things bringing the groceries in just anything where you can within their limits so if a child wants to help you bake they may not want to do any of the kneading but they can pour in the ingredients. They can use a big spoon to stir those ingredients, okay? So getting them involved as much as they feel comfortable with. Um, now, limiting distractions. I did actually yesterday say to a parent, we need to give him an iPad with headphones when he's eating. Um, so limiting distractions as much as possible. So in general, we say turn off the TV, you know, change their position so they're not facing um, everyone, take away any toys, if it's going to help them focus on that meal. Obviously, however, sometimes the way that we can screen everything out is by giving them headphones, by giving them the TV. You know, if that's going to make them feel more comfortable, and it might be that they're just watching something they've seen before, but it's familiar to them, so it's getting their arousal levels down, and they will then eat their food. Okay, um, so as I said, it's not a one size fits all. Um, yeah. Okay, so. In terms of OT, we will look at all the different skill areas where your child is having difficulties, okay? And that could be the sensory skills, the oral motor skills, and the general motor kind of practice skills. Um, we will often have a really rich, sensory rich environment where we have whole body experiences. And that's really useful for reducing tactile defensiveness, so going into the ball pit, um, ball pit using different um, pieces of equipment, say some lycra, um, lycra swings, for example, 
and that's then going to eventually lead to them being able to tolerate a bigger variety of foods. Okay, um, your tactile discrimination in your mouth is going to improve through that stimulation, and you can have a variety of oral toys, games, activities. So, um, blowing bubbles through a straw, you're going to get the lip closure. That's going to be um, a different part of it. Giving a child a piece of um, Biltong or beef jerky that they can just chew to work on on their chewing. So that's like the dried meat that you get in South Africa, and I think it's beef jerky in America. Um, or things like a, a long piece of dried mango um, that they can be chewing just to work on on those skills. Um, it's going to improve it that way. And again, that leads into our oral motor games. So activities that are going to strengthen the jaw um, in order for them to bite and chew. Um, and, and there are loads of different um, feeding programs, eating and feeding programs that you can use. Um, it's just about what works for your child at that point. Okay. Um, quite often we'll do things like, okay, I'm going to take a bite or something and then I'm going to spit it out. So you're working on all of those skills. And yes, it might be gross, but there's a reason why we're doing it, okay? Um, we're then going to say, right, actually, I, I really want to work on lip closure when I have a spoon in my mouth and then take it out um, or on my cup. Um, and we can act of loads of games for for that so your party blowers um just blowing a um a ping pong ball with the straw see how far it can go and um, all of those activities we have some specific activities for working on your tongue control so that you can improve how well they can manipulate the food inside their mouths and then once those foundations have been addressed and they set and a child has achieved them, we can then look at the eating and the drinking skills. Okay. Um, we can then look at our posture practices and motor skills. So again, it's those whole body movements, you're crawling, you're jumping, climbing, all those activities that are going to improve their postural stability, their shoulder stability, what's going to help them sit upright for the 5, 10, 15 minutes that they're at the table. Okay. Um, quite often we will use um, therapy and we'll get the child to make a sausage and then we'll use a knife and fork and we'll work on the whole idea of we're going to stab, saw, and then there's your piece of food, okay? Now we're gonna stab that and put it somewhere else. Um, so all of those activities, that yeah, it's gonna be fun and you're gonna build up those skills before you get to actually doing it with food. Um, yeah, and then just to say, there are a number of feeding programs that can help um, picky eaters. Some of them stand alone, some of them, um, are used by a wider range of disciplines. So for example, the SOS feeding program, that is OT, speech therapy, dietitians. Um, it's not just OT, for example. Um, some will use a variety of strategies from many different programs and try and integrate them that way. Um, and yeah, and it just depends on, on your child and, and you as a family and what's going to work for you. Um, okay. Um, what we're then going to do is, so we will do an assessment. An assessment to see what it is that the child is struggling with at which level, which stage. And we're then going to say, okay, so we're going to start here. And that's how we're going to progress intervention. Everything should be done in consultation with the family, because obviously it's not just about once a week with the OT. It's about little and often throughout the week. 
um, you're always going to work within that child's comfort levels, within the, the parameters, parameters of where they feel safe and secure. You're going to constantly be um, liaising with anyone else involved with that child. So, for example, the speech therapist, the dietitian, um, and making sure that you're really working alongside the family. So it's that constant collaboration, sharing of information. Um, and then again, depending on the child's needs, we're going to look at their foundational skills. So their sensory um, discrimination, modulation, their posture, their breathing, because, you know, if you take a breath while you are swallowing, that's going to cause a big um, physical action, coughing, coughing, choking. Um, and all of those need to be addressed before you can then move up to those specific oromotor skills or the interactions with food, okay? Um, and then we will use a variety of, of interventions and techniques as we go along. Um, as an example, what we'll do is we will, after our assessment and our clinical reasoning, we'll then say, okay, which stage is this child at? And where am I going to go to next? Now, a child can spend a long time in, in a stage or just a short time, or you can start on, you don't have to start at one if that's not where the difficulties lie, okay? Um, as I said before, we talk about that whole body sensory and motor needs. Um, quite often we'll use your traditional sensory integration type treatment strategies, which do involve the whole bodies, okay? Um, you'll then see quite often a child will spend most of that session engaged in gross motor activity because we always say you know if a child isn't um, doesn't have say for example strong enough shoulder girdle stability they're not going to be able to isolate the muscles so that they can use their knives and forks with their elbows at the side rather than lift it up there um, okay we then look at the oral sensory so looking at that sensitivity, that awareness around the oral structures. Um, and again, you're gonna have those specific games. We then look at the oral motor side, um, strengthening all of your structures, your lips for the lip closure, your cheek, your tongue, your jaw, everything that's gonna help that child bite, close their lips, chew, swallow, okay? Um, food exploration, that's going to be not related to the mouth um, and yeah so you're going to touch different foods smell them um, manipulate them pair them all of that without bringing it to the mouth okay and this is really important for a child who has that anxiety is that giving them a chance to know that today is just food play there is no expectation for you to take it to your mouth at all um, we then look at the oral food exploration and consumption. Um, so it's then working on the tasting, the putting it in their mouth, holding it, taking it out, moving it about, spitting it out, um, looking at it. So, oh, I put that in my mouth. Hmm, I chewed it. Whoa, that's what's happened with it, you know, and you can then choose whether you're going to eat it, that out or not. Um, so, it's about exploring and just being comfortable, being able to explore. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and then we're going to look at eating in functional environments, so different environments, um, making sure that a child has got enough skills that they feel comfortable to eat at a friend's house when they go for a play date, to eat at a restaurant, to eat at school. Um, and we want to make sure that everything that we've learned is that that function is crucial, that we can have that functional handover, that those skills that we've developed can be very functionally transferred and generalized. Okay. Um, um, how will you know if your child is going to benefit from some oral motor intervention. 
Um, they say three or more of the following. I always say, you know, you know your child best. Um, you have a child who's got a really limited number of foods that they eat. Um, they aren't growing. They're not taking in enough nutrients. There is a common pattern of a child choking or gagging. Um, kids who can't chew, they struggle to swallow. They can't be near foods, certain foods. They can't sit at the same table if his brother's having lasagna because that lasagna just makes him feel so uncomfortable. Um, these are different flavors, textures, and smells. Kids who are really specific about the food, how it's prepared, what it looks like, the brand of the food. Um, if your child is struggling oh, sorry, to use a straw, uh, a knife, a fork, a spoon, a cup, the different types of cups. Um, if your child having a lot of kind of emotional symptoms, meltdowns, outbursts related to the eating and feeding. Um, those kids who eat very slowly and get really tired when they eat. Um, the kids who eat incredibly fast and they almost like just, um, you know, it's just too fast, the, the pace at which they eat. Um, the kids who eat very messily, the kids who stuff food in their mouth. Um, you might find that you have kids who pocket food, so they'll chew and you'll then find three hours later, they still have a bit of their breakfast in their teeth. Um, your child can't sit at the table for meal times. Um, they're struggling with a different environment, different um, you know experiences, different people. Um, any of those, which is going to impact their enjoyment um, around meal time, around family time, um, might be worth speaking to to someone about those. Okay. And now we have time for questions. So I, um, yeah, I haven't checked the chat. I don't know if any questions have come in. Um, oh, right. So, um, um, ba -ba -ba. I'm just going through the messages. Um, okay, so there are no questions. Apologies to Holly who couldn't um, hear. Um, if there are any questions, just let me know. So um, in terms of how you can refer, I would go to your GP um, and say these are the difficulties. Um, be really specific in the evidence that you've collected. And you know, say, can they refer you to the local feeding team? Because most, um, um, yeah, because most areas will have, will have a feeding team that you can refer to. Um, speak to the school, ask them if they know who the local feeding team is, um, and then get the ball rolling that way. If your child is younger, you're obviously going to look at your health visitor. Um, for example. Okay. Um, so when am I doing food labs? Okay, so our food labs, we tend to wait until we have kids who we can pair. And that makes it quite hard. Um, you want to get kids who are at a similar level so that they can encourage and motivate each other. Um, it's quite hard if you have a child who's really, really struggling with textures and one who's absolutely fine and they're miles ahead and trying everything new, um, doing the whole kind of the scientific experimenting with food. So, yeah, so what we do is we wait for the referrals to come in in terms of the food lab and then we see how we can match kids. But often it will be a very small group, two or three, because every child has their individual difficulties and we want to be sure that we can support the kids and their families with that. Um, what is the difference in approach and responsibility between OT and adults? Um, so I think um, that just depends on the area that you're in. 
um, OTs, so for example, speech therapists can and will often do SOS feeding program, but what you'll still have then is that say if the OT isn't trained, say in the, in the feeding program, the speech therapist will do the feeding program, but you'll still have OT going on in the background to work on those foundational skills. Um, OT, um, speech therapists do a lot of kind of the um, talk tools where they work on developing skills around the mouth. So yeah, that's, um, that's it. Okay. Um, Noreen, you have put your hand up. Would you like to ask a question out loud? Hi, yes. Um, my little one, Zane, he is what you call the fussy eater in our house. Yeah. You know, I, a lot of your presentation, I can really see that how, you know, when he looks at certain food, especially when it's gooey, gravy consistency, you know, savory, gooey, gravy consistency, he'll look at it, he'll close his eyes, and, you know, he'll, he'll say, I doesn't like it, I doesn't like it, get it away from me, you know, and it's all about texture, what texture with him. And, you know, simply even a banana, you know, he won't eat a banana like that. Yeah. So, you know, I've done the whole, should we touch the banana? Should we give the banana a tickle? Should we smell the banana? And he'll go as far as doing that. And, you know, we'll peel the banana. Should we mash the banana? He'll mash the banana. <laughs> but it yeah. won't go in the mouth. Yeah, and I think that's where you can see that actually he needs, he's struggling with the sensory side. Yes, with the introception. And that's where that specific input is going to be. So if he's going to have um, OT, they're not going to work on actual eating. They're going to be working on his tactile system. Yeah. Um, he copes with textures, um, that whole body, and then gradually moving it to his head and his face. Um, yeah, he might be a child, I don't know, if he struggles with like teeth cleaning or having his face wiped. Um, you need to prepare him before you do that. You can't just go in and wipe his No, you can't. I mean, he, I mean, he's good with face washing and teeth cleaning now. It was a struggle before. Yeah. But with him, you know, the whole banana thing, it's okay to mash it and put it in a banana pancake. It's okay to have a banana chip. It's just that texture. It's pinpoint. He's really... He's really clever about it. That's the yeah. thing. Yeah. And I think also, you know, it's sometimes it is about also choosing your battles. If he'll eat a banana chip, which is hard and crunchy, yeah. that's a win, right? That's yeah. he's getting those nutrients in that way. Bananas are just on a personal note, bananas are just, you know, they are tricky. I didn't eat bananas. I think. I was in England already before I started eating bananas. So I must have been in my late 20s, early 30s before I actually ate bananas because a banana might look perfect outside. Then you open it. It looks good. You put it in your mouth. It's never the same. It's not that, you know what I mean? It's not consistent. A banana that you eat today is not going to be exactly the same as no. tomorrow and the day after. Um but yeah, maybe it's quite it, it is a, feeding time is a battle. I have to be really creative with him just to get the nutrients in him. Yeah. That's why I've noticed. And, you know, even the colour of food, beige, crispy, dry. Yeah, you know, I've managed to get, get him, spin it into him if I, you know, I steam it, I blender it and put it, you know, make like spinach tortilla wraps or, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. flatbread. Yeah. So it's green. We we'll call it dinosaur, dinosaur. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. also important is doing that kind of that playful thing. Yeah. So, um, I don't know where I'm, I'll find a picture later, but we had like a green day and there was broccoli and peas and hummus yeah. and everything on the plate was really messy and green. And we were driving our trucks through things and there was no demand of having to eat it. Um, it's just getting familiar with that first. Um, so I would say definitely he's one where you're going to start and work on that tactile defensiveness. Yeah, it, it is a struggle, I must admit. It, it is, and it's, it's so emotive, you know, being able to feed 
your child and give them that nutrition and that nurturing is it's so emotive because that's kind of what we are designed to do right mm. as parents we give our kids hugs we feed them we make them feel safe and yeah so it's um it is yeah it's very hard no thank you your your information you gave is really like an eye opener oh excellent yeah. um, would anyone else like to put their hand up, ask a question out loud, type anything? You, um, as usual, you know, you can email me any questions um, and any information. We will send a PDF of the presentation. I'll send that to him and he can um, pass it on like he did last time. Um, I'm just trying to think, yeah. So I think it's that emotional side is is massive um and it's not to be discounted so yeah is there any other questions any comments from anyone thanks for that anisa that was all really really, really great Excellent. um do you have any questions tom are you struggling with bananas or <laughs> <laughs> no i've never liked bananas so uh, I'm with your, with your son, uh, Noreen. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I've never found the texture appealing at all. <laughs> um, they're good for banana muffins, Noreen. You could try that, mash them, and then make them into banana muffins. Um, and then say, oh, look, you've eaten bananas. <laughs> yeah, he, lo he loves banana muffins. Um, it's just, uh, you know, tapping, tapping the whole savoury... Yeah. Your veg as well that's another it's yeah. it's just a daily battle it's like what we're going to feed him today i yeah. dread it i really do yeah so. oh. okay. um right any other questions coming up from i can't see any in the chat oh we've got is it important to have a diagnosis nope quite often i don't know specifically what diagnosis do you mean um but you can have a child who has got no diagnosis who would appear completely neurotypical, but they are struggling with eating. Yeah. Um, so I would say no, um, it's not important, it's crucial to have a diagnosis before you start um, on some interventions with that. Um, okay. What are we thinking? Anything else? No. Um, and then, yeah, same thing to anyone who's listening to the recording. Please do feel free to send me an email um, if you if you have any questions. Okay. Great. Think? And the um, for anyone who missed it, the Kingston PCF website, our um, Facebook link is in the chat box. Or trapped box on the on the right, um, and as well as the upcoming events. So um, do join us for the next three events we have left with Anissa. Yeah. Cool, but I think that's a good place to to wrap up. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. Thank you for joining us today, guys. Um, are you welcome, Rob? Um, yeah. Thank you for joining us, and I'll see you guys. It's next week, isn't it, Tom? It is, yes. Same uh, Wednesday next week. Yeah, at 11. 11 a.m., yeah. yeah. Okay. Right, so I'll see you guys then. Um, yeah, any other questions, just let me know. I'm glad it was useful, Noreen. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's us done, Tom. Okay. It is. Excellent. Cool. Okay. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. Bye. Bye.